Hi, everyone. Sorry, um, you thanks. need that one? Yeah, okay. I need that one. Yeah. Uh, what a cliche, right? Uh, the German guy from the dirty diesel vendor being the last one between you guys and free beer. Uh, so sorry for that. Yeah. Um, also, being German, apologies always first. I have a cold, so I might have to sneeze at some point. Also, this is water if my voice breaks up. Please don't tell the Bavarian government. There might be some regulation I'm violating by not drinking a beer. Please just don't. Um, it also might be a vendor allergy because I probably spend way too much time with my buddies from, from Dragos and Security Matters already, but I think it's still the cold, so just kidding, guys. With that, yeah, welcome to the last talk. This is me, so like, like our first speaker this morning, Mark Bristow, so actually you guys have to deal with two-thirds of the SANS ICS 515 instructor team at this event. That happens not very often. Um, yeah, I, I, work for, <laughs> I work for a big evil organization as well. Um, since we have too much um, spare time in, in Germany, I, I also teach for SANS. And um, what a fun. Yeah, occasional rat humor. This means more I'm not the whole pen testing thing. I can't kind of like the physical stuff as well. So when I do rat teaming, it usually means breaking in, wrecking things, um, playing with cars. Um, also, one of the reasons why I didn't send in some, some requests for um, like questions polls, um, but I'll ask you a couple of questions right away. So where are we today? Um, first question for you guys, just show of hands. Uh, how many of you have taken the SANS ICS 515 class, by the way? There are quite a, quite a few alumni here, so yeah, thank you for that. Hope you got something out of it. The next one, I mean, my, my actual day job, um, working for Audi. Is anybody in here that actually drives an Audi? You're uh, at least two. Uh, thank you for that. Three, four, maybe five. So yeah, you, you keep doing that, please. Um, so I can still work for them and, and travel around. Last one, and then you'll get to the point why, why I didn't send in those questions. Does any one of you actually drive an electric vehicle already? Show of hands. Oh, quite a few. None of ours yet. There's the e-tron A3 out, but the new one is coming in March. It's just been announced to the public. Official release is in January, but that's just internal customers, and then it's coming out in March. I had the luck to drive it last week. We did some pen testing with it, actually. Um, wow. So has any one of you ever done something like we just heard in the last talk with GPS on a German Autobahn going at 200 kilometers per hour? There you go, right? So, auto industry, where are we at right now? Um, when it, usually, I've, I've been showing a couple of these slides for the past 18 months or so, especially in the auto industry. I think there's no one from the auto industry here. That would be my last show of hands here. Anyone from the auto industry in this room? No. So I can basically tell you anything and everything about what we do. Yeah, for some strange reason, we're getting to learn how IT does disrupt your industry. So, since we're the auto industry, we're, we're very arrogant about what we do, right? German auto manufacturer, Audi, we're always the best, sure, right? We're having to work like everybody else with three major paradigm shifts at the same time. So, we're moving from you do everything by yourself to more assisted, up to autonomous driving. Um, we're moving from petrol engines to electric vehicles, and we're moving from owning cars to ride sharing car hailing, Ubering, all that stuff. And I've heard just like how Uber changed some people's lives here just yesterday again. So yeah, this is happening a lot. So each single one of these is about the size of going from horse carriages to um, what, what then became a modern car. We're doing all of them at the same time. So this is, this is quite interesting times in the auto industry. You can say that it's fun if you're in security because we have job safety, right? If you're actually making those cars, it's not that much fun. It's actually a lot of hard work. So software is also becoming more and more of a USP, as we call it, so unique selling proposition. So cars, especially with the regulations we have around emissions, yeah, and that's the only time I will mention that again, being Audi. Um, electric vehicles are very similar to a certain extent, so we have to distinguish, especially in the premium auto market where we are in. So software is becoming important. Yeah, there have been those, those slides you've probably seen in, in other talks or presentations, more source lines of code than a fighter jet. I'll leave that as it is. 
it is a main differentiator. If, if you look at the right-hand side, you see the... Um, actually, that's from Ars Technica. Um, thanks to those guys for that. Um, usually our, our MMI, so our internal navigation system and entertainment system comes out winning when, when they test it. For some reason, they like it. I like it since we started thinking correctly. Like in Bavaria, we turned the clock this way. So they had it like all the way wrong until the last model. So I usually always messed up when I had to work in an Audi, the navigation system. But this is kind of the heart of what we actually do. This is how we distinguish modern vehicles, more by interior design, what services we offer. And then, yeah, by the way, we can go 200 with an EV on the Autobahn. But many can do that. For some strange reason, though, software is not a core competency of auto manufacturers. So again, just from, from guessing, from, from your points of view, what is probably what we know best when it comes to actually producing cars? Not R&D, but producing cars. You probably have your guesses, so I'll, I'll destroy them right away. 70% of the parts that come into a car are not made by ourselves. They come from our suppliers. So what do we actually make ourselves? The bodies. That's like the, the huge robot play. Um, so ICS is a big thing. Yeah, happen to do incident and response there from time to time. So this is actually our main experience. So going from yeah, welding and pressing and shaping car bodies, like steel plates into shape to become a car body, to being a very sophisticated software maker for the innards of a vehicle is quite a step. So this takes a long time, also conceptually, to wrap your head around that this is completely different than from what we used to be doing before. Also, when we did that pen test the last two weeks, so yeah, lots of the stuff I'll talk about will not be on the slides, otherwise I wouldn't have in the current media situation with um, Volkswagen Group not have gotten this approved. So. I won't go through the slides as much. I'll just tell you some stories. So for the past two weeks, what we did was um, invite some of the best reverse engineers that we know of from all over the world, um, have two prototype EVs that we're shipping in March, and lots of, lots of testing equipment and have them go at it. Like, try to, try to break it. Anything, anything goes. So what all of them told me I was there, first week I was away teaching for SANS. We got to fly everywhere on beautiful places and then stay inside for a week and teach people. That's lovely. Yeah. Um, second week, I tried to spend as much time as I could with the hackers because that's what we love doing, right? Spending time with hackers. So um, what all of them told me was, wow, this is a data center on wheels. So it's just, just not just complicated, it's complex. And if, if you're kind of missing the point of the difference here between the terms, I highly recommend you read a book by Stanley McChrystal, former US Army general, um, team of teams that goes into all, all the things of how this is a complex word and not any more complicated and how we have to deal with complexity in modern environments. This also explains a lot about how complex vehicles are. And um, it's not as easy as Martin just told in his, in his previous presentation with you sent via BTS, via the mobile network, a cut off the oil and engine message to the car. There are a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of components. So last question for the audience and then I'll just keep going. Just let's do a guessing game. So modern car, our, our latest, greatest Audi e-tron Quattro fully electric SUV, how many ECUs are in that car? What's your guess? More than 50 or less than 50? Who's, who's like 50-ish? 50, 50 Who would go for 80? 90? 100? More than 100? Yeah, 42 would be great. That would be awesome. Actually, our maintenance system is called System and Service 42. So there are some people with humor inside Audi. But yeah, we have, I think, like 127 in that. So 127 different 
computing units that are kind of networked. There's not a CAN bus, there's like eight to 10 of them, and four to eight FlexRay buses, and a little bit of Ethernet, so it's, yeah, it's complicated. There's routing, there's firewalls, yeah, there's ACLs, there's all that stuff. So this is complex. Understanding it is really difficult. And then we get into the new world with software and everybody wants to be agile and a certain EV manufacturer out of North America puts out statements like, we'll update software box in our cars in 72 hours. And that's the Audi manager at R&D when I go to a meeting there telling me, yeah, let's do it in 48 hours. What's the problem with that? Has anybody of you have ever had to deal with ISO 262662? That is the international standard for sh like whacking software into shape that you can actually put it in production vehicles that drive over the roads. And that's relating to safety. So it's not everything in your car, but every piece of software that's safety related. So part of ISO 26.26.2 is no recursions, no loops in the code. Try writing an IDS or any modern kind of um, detection system without loops, without recursions, and any complicated stuff, because this code has to be provable at all times. So, yeah, safety for the definition, protect the world from the car, um, because we might run into stuff. Security, protect the car from the world, because bad things might happen to the car, right? And the people inside it as well. So these, these two different worlds meeting is actually a huge problem when it comes to paradigms, when it comes to culture, understanding how we work. I'll get into a bit more of, um, about this later when we talk about over-the-air updates. But first, hype meets reality. And probably most of you have read some stuff about cars getting hacked and we're all going to die in flaming cars that are creaming autonomously down the road with no control. It looks a bit like um, in that remake of War of the Worlds when they're standing at this um, railroad intersection and that train is running past a flame, like fully ablaze. So this is kind of the imagination some people have. So let's get to, to some of these um, news reports we had um, over the past couple of years. Yeah, it's game-changing for FBI and ISIS. So there was some reporting that ISIS supposedly created self-driving cars that were basically autonomous bombs on wheels. Um, yeah, there was some research probably. It was remote-controlled cars. We had RC cars for many years. Um, it's line of sight, like, so it doesn't go fully autonomously someplace. If they had solved that problem, we, we should have bought out those people and, and make them peaceful again and because that is actually a hard problem. We're still not there yet. Has anyone seen a fully autonomous car on the road somewhere recently? I uh, wouldn't have thought so, right? Driverless cars could be used as lethal weapons. Yeah, maybe. If, if you're talking the, the um, e-tron quattro, it's empty weight. It's two and a half tons. Um, it doesn't change much if you charge the batteries, though. It's maybe two grams more. But yeah, it's, it's 800 kilos of lithium-ion battery. If that could park autonomously and you could play around with that and go fully geohots on the, on the charging electronics and have the batteries blow up, then probably something bad might happen. And, and I can neither confirm nor deny that we might have had talks with the FBI about stuff like that because people are concerned. So yeah, batteries, you, you try to create your batteries that they don't go full Tesla or Fisker Karma on, your, on you and don't burn up all the way, so there's lots of protection in that. And that Google car, that's I fly hot air balloons. If you try to drive or fly that into a building, it's like nothing really happens. So we're not there yet. Criminal concerns of your um, self-driving cars. Um, those of you that read XKCD comic, I didn't bother with putting it up here again because I already overused that in previous talks. Just Google XKCD and self-driving car. Like the guy tells the car to like throws a rock in that weighs like a human and then tells it to drive to Alaska. That would be fun. And kind of that I've been playing with my engineers over the past six years actually, like asking them if I were really evil and told the car that this transport over there is the parking garage and make it go there and then once that's filled up, go off to Sansistan or someplace. Um, makes car stealing easy, right? Actually, it's, it's, again, way more complicated than that. Yeah, again, the bombs, because that's where we are, right? It's all terror and we're all gonna die. 
if we had already solved the problem of self-driving cars, then, then I would be giving another presentation, right? We're not there yet. We're happy if the car can figure out that it can actually go on the road and not um, go past this, this fully drawn circle you just put around it with a spray can because then it tells the car, oh, it's a closed line or a double yellow line. I'm not supposed to cross it and I'm polite, so I won't do that. So we're not, we're not there yet. Hackers are the real obstacle for self-driving vehicles? No, actually developing self-driving vehicles is the obstacle for self-driving vehicles. This is really complicated. And people try to create shortcuts for that, like engineers are just people, right? So if you look into the recent reporting, um, the, the yeah, tragic accidents that happened in, in North America a couple of months back. Much of that is because people cut corners and you just use the camera for recognizing what's going on outside. If it's dark at night and that camera works like the human eye, you won't be seeing anything. So you need radar and LIDAR and um, infrasound detection and all that and have to combine it into sensor fusion and then make sense of it. And each of these senses for some strange reason, physics work in these as well, has limitations and differences, and you have to figure all that out, put it in an algorithm, create sensor fusion, and then figure out what your surroundings are for you as a vehicle. So that's actually a hard problem to solve. Yeah, and not many are there yet to fix that. And then this happens. So Chris and Charlie, shout out to them, great guys. But reporting, so a couple of years back, they did the famous GPAC, probably most of you have heard of it, right? Who has not heard of the GPAC? Like when a Jeep careened off into, into the grass. Yeah, you've all seen that, right? So whenever those guys put out reporting like this, the machine at Audi spun up. So C-level directors called down the chain of command, like, like my boss, the CISO of Audi. Could this happen to us? Um, and that happens usually because we're a German engineering company, so 6.30 in the morning, you, he gets that call. So he's a very nice guy, so he calls me like, 7.30, 8-ish, and then we spin up the team, we have to come back with a reply by 11. So figure out who can give that answer in your company as quick as that. So yeah, thanks to those guys. I had some crazy mornings. What, what kind of got lost in the reporting, and those two, Chris and Charlie, did put that out, is it took them a year to create this attack. It wasn't like, hey, let's hacker a car yeah, I have a Jeep in my garage, let's, let's take that. Let's take the Cherokee and let's hack that to pieces and drive it off the road. No, actually developing the attack and figuring out how the architecture works, and that's a very simple architecture in that car, took them a year. So cars differ quite a bit, so, so creating an a autonomous attack against vehicles that works against all of them, we're, we're far away from that. Here's one that actually works, radio extension. So one of the most famous ways to steal a car nowadays, you probably have some place where you store your keys right behind your front door. Um, you can use radio extension if you have this, this luxury feature in your car that you just come close to the car and don't have to take the key out and press the button like I have to do on my old car. You just go there, open the door, cars know you're there. So radio extension works on that. Yeah, that's a problem. And I'm, I'm looking sternly at my own company that thought we can do crypto as well because we can do everything because we're German auto engineers and then we create crypto that is as good as we can break it, right? You, you've all read Schneier, so you know how that goes. Next generation of keys we'll put, be putting out next year actually don't work that way anymore. So this can be fixed, but it it's a, takes a long time. And we'll get to why these things take a long time in a second. But yeah, this is what usually happens then. Yeah, we're all gonna die. This is all so terrible. Cars will careen off the road. Uh, management wants us to create car socks because you, on your way to um, the office every morning, you're probably running past like two, three burning wrecks of cars that have been hacked to death, all that stuff. So the exaggeration that we're dealing with in the media usually is quite a bit overblown. And on the top of that, shout out to all the nice vendors. You get all the boxes sold that will solve your problems because we are a box-oriented um, industry still. So we think that if one ECU doesn't work, let's just put in another. That's usually how you solve physical problems in vehicles. You all know that security doesn't work that way. So putting an IDS in a car or putting a, another firewall in the car or throw in um, 
a blockchain on top of an IDS, on top of what else do we have, DLP, and just as a side dish at Cyberlands, so we can all see the map on the MMI, so we know if everything's still there. Would that actually solve a problem? We don't know. But this is, of course, what, what no one ever at a car company wants to see, right? That, I'm sorry, the car is not moving because we've been hexered. That doesn't work. So, come this year, DAFCON, those two gentlemen again, first they said, we, we won't hack cars anymore. Now they have their own company that actually does security and um, evaluation for vehicles. Actually found out safety and security isn't so bad. Actually, we're doing some kind of job there. Um, I can assure you that we still have a long way to go, but yeah, actually it is quite hard. Think back to what those folks said. And they used to reverse engineering ECUs from, from other um, systems like, like tractors, trailers, huge building machines, all that kind of stuff. So they have some experience and they said, wow, this is a data center on wheels. This is complex. This is hard to find the way through, even if you get inside via the com box, for example, via, via GPS or via the radio. That's just the first step. And there are another 40 ECUs in between before you can mess with the brakes. So, it is actually a hard problem to make a car do something crazy on the road. You can annoy people by, for example, we, we did that last week. Um, can either confirm or deny would the, be the official answer. So we might have played with the GPS, so the car started assuming that it was in the center of the earth, or in New York where it was actually driving around Ingolstadt, or in some other funky place where we're careening down the Autobahn with 200 kilometers per hour. Um, I'm still here, so nothing bad happened, right? And I mean, we wouldn't have gotten into the car and drove it at max speed on the Autobahn if we weren't sure that playing with the GPS and playing with the time of the car and playing with the com box would have affected driving safety, right? We're, I tend to do crazy stuff. I, I, I do red team from time to time, but I like my life, so I, I don't do crazy stuff that would kill me if, if I go there. So actually, it's not that bad, but lots of stuff that gets sold around cars and gets discussed that we have to put in perspective a bit. So over-the-air updates, right? Should be easy, right? We do it with all our phones like every three months or so when, when Apple puts out an update and you Android guys whenever um, your vendor feels like it, so maybe never, maybe every year. But we, we believers in the church of Apple, I kind of like do the two-month to three-month dance and update every iOS device. And it, it works most of the time, right? Um, disregarding the Apple Watch, where it sometimes doesn't, but it, it's magic, right? So it solves the problem, so why can't we over-the-air updates in our cars? Well, <laughs> think back to ISO 262662. Would you sit in a car Will we push out a software update for your ABS that we haven't really tested? Ah, he's, you're nodding. You're, you're, a, you're a red teamer, right? You're a crazy person like me. So yeah, give it a try and then figure out that it works on a dry road, but not in Sweden in the middle of winter where we actually test our cars. So the longest time for a software rollout in a vehicle that's safety related is not developing the update. It's not getting the updates to the vehicles, it's actually testing it. So very hot, very cold. So that usually means very hot South Africa or Nevada, Death Valley. Very cold means Sweden or Norway. We have actually test ranges in northern Sweden in Lapland to test the cars under harsh winter conditions. Very wet, very dry, very fast, very slow all of that, and we have to prove with new stuff that gets into a car, one million road kilometers until we can get that into production. So even the planning for these tests takes a couple of months. So the whole, we can update your car in 72 hours, yeah, we can do that with the infotainment system, but not, we should never ever do that with something safety related. And we should not cut back on that time, especially as those systems are becoming more and more complex. So what's happening starting next year is, amongst the other regulations that we have to deal with, um, thanks to our own accord, like WLTP, New Emission Standards, it's UNECE 
we'll formulate some regulations around software updates and software management and how we version control the software we put out into cars. But that's just a very small portion of it. And I'm at the moment a bit fearful that we will start overlooking all the, all the other important pieces. Think back to this morning's talk um, that Mark and Ben gave about everything that comes into account when it's about instant response and detection capabilities and all that stuff. There are no standards for getting data out of vehicles. None. There's one company that I know of that is able to forensically get data out of vehicles and they only work with law enforcement and only in the United States and sometimes with insurance companies. Even we as car vendors have no way of getting at that thanks to the contracts we have with our suppliers. We're not allowed to reverse engineer lots of the ECUs that we have in the cars because that's their intellectual property. So we can't just go in there everywhere and do that. We need to get regulations for that. We need to get regulations for what's legally allowed. Would you want me to have a look at your Audi A7 to how you're driving and just to figure out that there might be malware on it? Probably not. Probably there's some limitations to how far you want me to look into your vehicle, right? All of that comes into play here. So I don't even know at this state if the cyber kill chain actually works as it is for a car or if we need a subversion of the ICS cyber kill chain for vehicles. We have to start building these models. We have to start testing this out. This is where we actually have to do lots of the work and the development. <clears throat> so I already mentioned cars are not getting hacked. With two exceptions. Tuning, so optimizing your car, and I know that especially in Sweden there are some great tuning meetings where the racers meet and you have all these fancy cars and you like tweak the engines and all that stuff. And vendor independent maintenance is important and you might have been following the discussion in the United States when it comes to large farming equipment and like the vendors there go more to a service-oriented model, like we all want to go there, frankly, because we, we, we know start calling all, all of us car companies, are not calling us car companies or auto manufacturers anymore, we're mobility providers. So that means we're trying to transition to a service-oriented model. So the car is just a part of what we actually sell you. So that includes closing the software and farmers are not happy with that because of course there's not enough service personnel, especially during um, harvesting season, so they had a, DNC DCMA, a DMCA exception for a while that was taken back, I think this year, so now they are not allowed to legally mess with the software on their tractors and trailers and harvesters anymore if they break down and they have just the next three days to do the harvesting and then bad weather comes in but no technician comes in for the next three days then they have a huge problem. Right? So the whole discussion we will have around that and looking at what should be legal and what not and if you buy a car, how much do you actually own of that? So the whole discussion we are currently having in computers and when it comes to mobile phones and all that stuff will also move toward the vehicle and all the fun that will be filled with that. So current state of vehicle incident response is actually more vulnerability assessment and finding them in the first place. So figuring out if a vulnerability is found, is it bad? If so, how bad? How do we deal with it? Give options to the execs in our company of how to deal with that and how to make this go away. Do we have to put up a recall? Is it safety related? Then a ticker starts. We have 72 hours until we have to inform the authorities, until we have to come up with a plan of how do we deal with that. A recall is very, very expensive. They happen frequently because car gets, cars get more and more complex, so mistakes do occur. But how do we deal with them? That there has to be a decision tree. Good example is Matt McKay's team at GM. They call it incident response what they do, but actually what they do is just what I described. If you are interested in that, I highly recommend you read that. Um, it's from this year's Sense Automotive Summit. Um, really, really interesting of how they actually deal with vulnerabilities that get reported or detected on their own accord in their vehicles. And I think that's, that's where we all should be moving as automotive companies over the next couple of years. Current state of vehicle socks, again, cars don't get hacked outside the lab, except for tuners, and we kind of 
like and not like that at the same time because we love people showing how much is in the cars and then we hate them when they put them, bring them to the dealership and want them fixed because they completely overstep the, the limits of what the car is allowed to do legally. But yeah, I mentioned ECU forensics still completely in its infancy, so we need standardization around that. The legal situation is really unclear. So again, China is a bad example as always. We're not allowed to get any car data out of China, so we have to put our own sock there or data collection or whatever. Russia, same thing. Every other company is coming up with different ideas. So GDPR in Europe, huge problem. Um, just from a different industry, and I won't mention the industry and the company, but I was just talking to a couple of the German top 30 corporations um, a couple of weeks back, and one of the guys mentioned to me that their GDPR regulations or their, their data retention time, log retention time, is seven days. How many incidents do you detect in seven days of log data? Yeah, nothing, right? So, and, and then, of course, it's always, yeah, vehicles are always online, right? In Sweden, yes, because you have a really cool mobile network. Like when I was up in North Sweden, I still had like four bars on my cell phone and 120 kilometers around me, there was no one. In Germany, I can assure you, in Bavaria, ah, it's not like that. So many parts of the world, this, this online real-time telemetry from a car to the cloud where I'm sitting and monitoring your car is just not going to happen. So. Why, why does this actually happen? Um, you all know how risk works and how adversaries think and how they exploit risk, so we just fly over that. By the way, this and the next slide I stole from my good friend at SANS, Doug Wiley. Um, so, of course, they capitalize on risk, they exploit anyway, so what we should actually be doing is creating attack trees into our environments. You saw a little bit of that in Marcin's talk, about like how to think about, for example, how the radio is connected to your environment and what it does. So this is actually where you can do quite a bit in research with vehicles, but you need one thing at least, or two things, you need a license to do that, and you need a bunker, because if you do open BTS and Pico cells, you're probably going to pick up all the other radio traffic and cell phone traffic in your vicinity. I might or might have not, not have done that just very recently, so I know you need a bunker. Happily for that, your car is probably not sentient yet, so it doesn't have a relationship with your lawnmower, so you should be fine. But Again, attack trees are really important and understanding the environment and how you get into it, and especially the customer, because why do adversaries do that? There's money to be made, right? Car theft is a thing. So if we fix the radio extension problem with the keys, then the next thing they will do, and that's what we're preparing for naturally, is they use the smartphone lock and lock feature that, that we now all have, all the major luxury manufacturers at least, so you don't have to give the car key that you haven't seen in the past two weeks anyway, because you don't need it when you get close to the car. It's somewhere in your pocket, right? You, you've, you've lost it already. But so for your kids, you give them the, the privilege of opening and driving your car for the next four hours, but they have to be back at 10 p.m. If they're not, they get stranded out in the middle of nowhere, like where Joe lives in uh, Sandistan West, I think, and then they call him and, ah, you have all that stress there. But yeah, no, the thing is, for sharing and rental, of course, everybody uses a smartphone, right? So attackers will use these, naturally. For, for auto theft, if I can fully automate figuring out where the cars are that I want to steal, usually that's steal to order nowadays, it's great if I can hack the back end, figure out the, where vehicles are, get the VIN, so the vehicle identification, and then send my minions off to pick up the cars, and I don't have to watch people like for days on end, so figuring out when, when the car is unattended. I can optimize that, so it's good for the um, business model of criminals, and also fleets. Think ransomware. Think internet weapon. And people calling you up um, early in the morning and explaining to you that, yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice Audi EV fleet you have there, dear Hertz or Avis or whoever your rental company is. It would be a bad thing if they stop working tomorrow morning, but we can fix that, right? 10 million every week for the rest of the existence of the planet Earth, and then we'll make sure of that that never happens. But we have a small demonstration for you here. So ransoming is a thing. If you have connected vehicles, that's something we have to deal with. And of course, damage, like the FBI mentioned, yeah, bad things that happened in just the past two years, and we don't want to be part of it. This is natural. I mean, misusing these, these vehicles as weapons is bad. The good news actually is that modern trucks actually do have a prevention. They cannot drive into loads of people. That's why they have to get old trucks. And with 
commercial vehicles, the turnaround is quicker. So if we have updates that help fixing things there, we get them faster on the road actually than with your standard cars. Adversary is always a question of perspective. So what's coming out also next year with our cars is what we call function on demand. So actually like Volvo had it planned for a couple of years already. We ship more stuff in the car than we actually have to, according to your order, because that saves us a lot of money in, in um, logistics and storage. So if you want a full laser light or if you want uh, 20 more horsepower or whatever, you just get a license code and type that in. So if you find a way around that, we're all in full cheap, cheat mode gaming land there. Of course, people have an interest in getting around that for not, not, not paying um, us even more money than they already have to. Also, as I mentioned, advances in access security will advance the game, the cat and mouse game we're playing with our adversaries all the time, and connected fleets, yeah, right? Connected fleets to me is the largest problem. This is actually where instant response and socks and all that makes sense, because they have one owner, they're connected, and I don't deal with us as the manufacturer, I deal with the owner of the fleet and they're responsible for creating their socks and detection and all that stuff. So this makes sense. So how do we defend that? Again, there's no silver bullet. Just please disregard all the buzzwords about products. We should get started with the basics. So architecture, probably all of you know the sliding scale of cybersecurity, so I spared you that on another slide. So. Think about design and architecture and how to have that modular. So how can we swap stuff? So we have to support vehicles for 15 years plus, so we really have to come up with modular architectures so we can come up with plans if something really breaks, like think recent reports about um, vulnerabilities in Broadcom, wireless chips and all that stuff. We should better be able to swap certain components in the vehicles, so get rid of that. Secure software development life cycles. Guess what usually gets thrown out first if you're rushing to market? And you all know that in your different industries, same here. This is not sexy. This is not a cool box with blinking lights you put in. This is hard stuff, but this is actually what makes software better. And then lots of testing and red teaming and testing again. And actually that's great fun as I just did last week, but it's tedious, hard work. There's no way around it. Standards, standards, and some more standards. Also no way around that. And we're still at the very beginning. I mean, if you ICS guys think that the ICS world, which is a large artificial term for all the industry out there, if you're at the beginning, we're at the very beginning here. But the good thing is we can still define that. We can still take part in how we move forward with that because we're such, so early in that, in that cycle. And of course, bridge the culture and language gap between that. I mean. We had it today during one of the talks at like the typical Q&A, like how many OT people are on your IT security team and vice versa, and how, how good, it, how easy it is to reach your different like stakeholders within the organization. I think how that works in, in CAR. Um, I'm, I'm corporation IT, so I'm the, I'm the nerd that makes your laptop not really work well. So do you trust me on, on having a say in how to design a secure architecture for a vehicle? Probably not. So how would we, do we solve that? It was mentioned already in a couple of the talks, by meeting the people, by going out for drinks, by understanding one another, by learning our different languages. I mean, auto language is very strange. SOP is uh, my most favorite term. No, it's not standard operating procedures. In car, it's start of production. And it's a date you will never ever move. That's a date you don't mess with. And lots and lots and lots of terms. Everybody has their ACDC, and in cars at Audi it means completely different. It's about data collection. So everybody has that. So you have to learn that. You have to learn the lingo of your peers, understand their problems and limitations. In security, it's always, why don't we patch cars? Why don't we fix that that easily? I hope I cleared something of that up with just talking about the, the length of test cycles. But this is where we all have to get started. Bridging that culture step, uh, gap to fix we we're moving. And little Bobby says it best always, so um, kudos to Rob, um, who gave me a hug when Dieselgate started and said, yeah, now you know how it is um, for car companies. He's been there, he, he'd been there with Snowden, so um, he knew how it was. So it was a fun two and a half years so far. But this is actually how we fix this. Architecture, design, 
good processes and the emphasis should always be on good processes and procedures. This is how we can actually get ahead of that. And many of you have a device in your pocket that is actually really, really secure by, cost, uh, by consumer standards and it's called the iPhone. So we do know that this works with some limitations, but we can actually ship products that are highly safe and secure. So we know this works. So this is where we all invite all of you, if you have some ideas of how to hack a car, if you have some ideas of how these different components might work or vulnerabilities, just let's meet, let's talk, let's move this forward, let's understand one another better. That's, that's for me, the greatest takeaway of the previous two weeks we had at Audi is the engineers talking to the hackers and vice versa and starting to understand their different, mo different modes of thinking. And regardless of what the findings were, regardless of, of how fast we can fix them, how severe they might have been, and they were interesting, but nothing safety related, luckily. But just people like expanding their worldview and how things work, that was just worth all of the one and a half years it took to actually get this two weeks, these two weeks on the road. With that, I won't be standing between you and three beers anymore. Um, thanks for listening, and I hope you have some questions for me. Thank you very much, Kai. You're welcome. Uh, they you. certainly do. So I'll give you the clicker, and I'll put this here and let you yeah, have to go sure. in. Drink some water. Okay, so uh, let's start off with the first question then. Um, is there a natural tension in auto industry between increasing visibility to enable monitoring security and preventing access to data systems to protect intellectual property? Definitely. And it's, as I mentioned, 70% of all the components inside the vehicles are not what we created. So, and just, just, the other day, there was reporting again about the Volkswagen Group and the strange relationship we have with our suppliers, and that applies to all the other car manufacturers as well. So we eye one another very, very tediously. So for them to have us looking at their IP, they're really afraid of that because we might go all Apple in them and creating those things ourselves. So it is a real problem. So that's where standardization is really needed. So we need some external help with standards bodies. We can all sit together and create something security-wise similar to what we have with, for example, emission standards. And I won't go into emission again. <laughs> all right. So I think that you browse on this one. Does Ode or Volkswagen uh, use some security development framework or similar methodology to minimize the cost and actually have some security implemented early in the development process? I I thought yeah, I heard we, you we say kind of, no, but we're I'm kind of all getting started with that. So, does anyone at the auto industry have a full SDL currently? I don't think so. No, <laughs> but we're getting there. But it's it's um, as as I think um, Ben and guys mentioned this morning. Um, case studies help. Stunt hacks like what Charlie and Chris did do help make a point to the board of directors, and then hopefully this doesn't go all the way Hollywood, but stays within reasonable stuff that you are supposed to be doing. Yeah, that's an yeah. honest answer. I appreciate it. So uh, there's someone here that wonders why you started pen testing just five months before you uh, started shipping, and I guess you hinted <laughs> at that answer too. <laughs> so, so an honest answer that I, I, I would label TLP yellow, so... Think, think, think what I just said about the different components. So when we got this started, so as we say, on the road as a car company, 18 months back, with an idea to let's get this started within six months. I sat in with a bunch of lawyers and we went through exactly like how many components do we have to car? 127 ECUs, oh my gosh. So how many of those do we have contracts where we can do reverse engineering? 20-ish? Hmm, what do we do? So the legal problems around that, including like all these top level executives that have, have a say in that, totally not trusting hackers and security guys like me from dusty corporate security. Um, most of what they know about security comes at best from Mr. Robot, at worst from CSI Cyber. So you have to lay a lot of groundwork there to, to 
build up this trust between a community and what we do. And also, of course, if we learn about something that is safety related, there is a ticker starting. So there are actual legal implications. And that being said, being a big corporation, probably some of you know that already because you're in a big corporation, no matter what you do, you'll get sued the next day. Right? It doesn't matter what you do, somebody will sue you. So that was kind of hard, but we're getting better with the next vehicles and we're doing that constantly. I mean, this is just a big example, but we're constantly pen testing new software versions and hardware implementations for our cars all the time. So I have a follow up on that. Do you have any gates, uh, kind of quality, or the bars, the black yeah. bars? Yeah. So if you find series or you qualify the, the findings that you have in pen test, you actually stop yeah. uh, the production? So so part of the product then will not be shipped in this form to the customer. Safety always comes first. Okay, so you have a process to yeah. handle that and then you just push the... the yeah. So we have something we call an A-cert, the auto-cert mm -hmm. inside. So they talk about these things, they figure out how to deal with problems and if something serious happens, it would never get to the customer because we have a reliability issue there. So okay. we would never do that. That feels confident. That's good that I have a Volkswagen then because it happens with them as too, right? Yeah, <coughs> you should upgrade because the, the technology underneath the Audi is what we control, oh, right. so I highly, I want to upsell you here right now, so get an A4 or an A6, okay. that's a lot better. Okay, so maybe I should cop another question I had here. They, they were wondering if you could have a test device just for testing from Audi, perhaps. We had a test car, I mean, yeah. can I have it in my backyard just for testing? No, no freebie? I mean, uh, okay, sorry. We want to, I mean, if, if you <laughs> really want to wreck your car, I mean, something <laughs> might really break. No, I just um, want, wanted you to give me an Audi. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I apologize for that one, sorry. So, uh, isn't Tesla pushing updates over the air? Uh, are they not held to the same ISO standard as you are? Yes, 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 and yes. So, I leave it at that. I, I, <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. So, yes, they, they, they shipped out a, an ABS update and they even mentioned in a press release that they didn't go through the full cycle of um, ISO required testing and that got them into trouble with the FMA and the um, NHTSA in the United States. So, um, just read it up because I don't want to blame other vendors there, but yeah, there are there's some issues around that. Thank you. Uh, what is the future of companies providing unofficial car upgrades for more power, for example? I think... Complicated answer, I'll try to cut real short. So this will go on with petrol engines. Will it go on with electric um, engines and EVs? To some extent, if they figure out how to, how to hack these or how to get our update codes so we can just put in more performance. But I think that as things move more towards service as something we sell, not so much just a product, that um, there will be a whole another cat and mouse game starting with the whole tuning scene. So All right. let's see how that works out. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Uh, so here's a, a, a question, why you pen test at all? What will it tell you? Um, <laughs> it will tell us to figure out how actually the architecture works and think that most modern cars are connected all the time, so there's a backbone. And actually, we run the backbone for all of Volkswagen Group currently. So we have a high interest in how does this actually work? How do paths into the vehicle work? How does the communication with the connected backbone work? And how secure and safe is all of that? So that you can still find out where the best parking spots in Stockholm are and not get annoying vodka ads on your navigation system if it gets hacked or something. Yeah, cheap example there, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we're selling you a service, so that's why we're so interested in this being as stable and reliable as possible. Okay. So someone wanted to know how long you have been working with software at, at Audi. How oh. long? Um, forever? Forever, basically, okay. but we kept ignoring it because um, having great suspension and a great engine and quattro was more important, but... Um, for the past couple of years, um, we started figuring out that actually having Sorry. features in software are better. I read the question wrong, I think. This is the number of people that are working The number with of people. We're currently in a transition where we figured out that we now call ourselves a digital company. So parts of IT have already been moved into R&D and, for example, the sales and marketing team and that creates the services around the customers. So we're starting 
to get everywhere inside the company. So actually the big thing, the big reorg that's happening right now is making everything, everyone a programmer. That's like the, the mission statement, so we're not going their full way, but yeah. So from 800 people in IT and probably 1,000 to 4,000 people that do software development currently as engineers, but usually you're not writing software inside as an engineer in Audi, you're directing suppliers that do that for you, but we're moving more towards a lot of that will happen internally as well, especially in R&D. So everyone in R&D will at some stage will be involved with software in the future and, and IT will be more integrated into all of the organization. I think I missed the number. Thousands. So currently, okay, so I mean, it's just a number I pull out of thin air. Okay, okay. It's, it's, so it's quite a few compared to the 82,000 people at Audi, but it'll go to yeah. ha at least half of the company yeah, involved yeah. in software. Okay, fair enough. So our, fi our uh, uh, this firewalls, our firewalls and ACLs primarily for car safety or for protecting Audi's IP. <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, That's a one, good one. <laughs> so mainly for car safety and security. I mean, first of all, for security. Second, to keep away funky stuff from safety relevant systems. For the IP, not so much. That's where we use code signing and encryption for. But um, Yes, um, we don't like people messing with the onboard diagnostics ports once the vehicle is moving, so next generation of vehicles will prevent you from riding onto that port when the vehicle is actually moving, and that totally makes sense if you think about that. So, but it's not IP, it's safety. Cool, okay, so here's the question. Uh, if you think IDSs are for cars or not? IDSs are for incident responders. That's the, the easy no, way out. No, IDSs, intrusion detection yeah, system. Yeah, IDSs. Oh, okay. An IDS is the Swiss army knife of an incident responder. So if there's no incident responder to go with an IDS, the IDS oh. by itself doesn't make any sense. And we've been there 15 years ago, right? I used to manage IDSs in a huge network 10 years ago. So if they run autonomously, what do they do? They create a couple of thousand events per day that don't make any sense. If you as an incident responder, active defender, use them as a visualization and detection tool, they make a lot of stuff possible. So will I protect your Audi in the future? No, I won't look at your car. You're in Russia. I'm not allowed to look at that car, right? So what will happen is data diodes, ACLs, firewalls, hopefully more of that, but an IDS outside a unique vehicle fleet that's owned by someone doesn't make any sense if you think about how protection technology gets used in IT environments. Okay, we'll soon wrap up. So one more question here. Uh, does Audi have a, have a hmm, do you have a bug bounty uh, program? We're working on that, so why not? Because legal, <laughs> it's, it's really, really difficult um, because if these things so, so if, if you know how this works with bug bounty, right? If a bug gets reported, you have to figure out how severe the bug actually is. You have to do some, some analysis and go to the lab and check out the bug. If it happens to be safety related, there's again that 72 hour time window, we have to report that. So if somebody reports that beforehand, before we even know if that bug's important, we get sued again and we have to do a recall and it might not even be safety related. So establishing the trust relationship and the legal framework inside an organization as big as ours, and we're just part of Volkswagen Group, one of the largest corporations in Europe, that's hard. And it's even harder with the current situation we're in. So what we're starting with is closed bug bounty programs. We've just done that, right? So this is where we get started. This is where we learn as an organization of how to profit from that and how to build up the trust relationship. And maybe a few years down the road, There'll be something more open, but I don't speak for the company, right? I'm not PR, so I don't know when that will happen. I hope to see it someday, but give us, give us some time, please. Okay, fair enough. So with that, I, I thank you. Thank you very much for thank your you. Interesting. Thanks. Thank you.